So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to my father, who is also your father. Can we rise to our feet and honor this wonderful gentleman who has been a blessing to us? Let's give it up for our father of faith, Pastor Ram. Pastor Ram, welcome, welcome, welcome. First, I want to just say thank you to Pastor Daniel and Pastor George. And I'm really grateful that you did not share any embarrassing pictures. So thank you. First of all, just know I was, I was holding my, I was like, you know, people have X-Files about me in this team. They just don't show you. So thank you for that. But I actually want to read a blessing that the Lord gave me as I was in worship, as we were in worship today. And it's Genesis 49. I'm going to just read it over you. May the God of your Father help you. May the Almighty bless you with the blessings of the heaven above and the blessings of the watery depth below, the blessings of the breast and the womb. May my fatherly blessing on you surpass the blessing of my ancestors, reaching to the heights of the eternal hills. And may these blessings rest upon your head as prince among God's people. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I just, I, I, I was in worship and God just said, bless, bless my people. I, I, wow, God is a God of, he's a father. And the first place he wants us to know him is as a father. And we have all kinds of transactional um, relationship with God. Some of us see God as our boss. Some of us see God as our king. Some of us see God as our master uh, and our Lord. Uh, some of us see God as a friend. And all these, all these are amazing and they're true. But Jesus models to us that the first place God wants us to know him is a father. He's a father. Way beyond all these other things. His first, our father. When Jesus, how do you address him? Daddy. Because our father in heaven, he used, the word he used is Abba. Abba is daddy. It's, it's, everybody in Jesus' day was shocked, by the way, because nobody called God that. It wasn't the thing. I mean, people did not call God Father, uh, not in a personal way. And they were angry at him for using that term. But that's what Jesus reveals to us, that God is his, our Father. And you know, there are some of you who are still struggling with this concept. And I know as I've been here, there have been so many divine encounters I've had with some of you. And you've had with different ones, as God is just restoring to us what fatherhood is. For some of us, our relationship with our father was so transactional. It was so task-oriented. It was those ones of, I love you, noted. <laughs> I love you, dad, noted with thanks. You know? <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it's, it's where we came from. Or oh, there was just no father figure. There, there just wasn't. And so it's just strange to call someone a father. It's just hard. But you know what that is showing you? It's showing you something about your relationship with your father in heaven. It's really a sign. If you're really struggling hard, that's the same struggle. It's just that it's easier to hide it when it's an abstract God out there who you don't see. And when you find that God puts people in your life, why does he do that? It's because he wants to reveal what's actually going on inside. That, my goodness, you're struggling. You don't actually understand me as a father. You've not really understood that. And God wants us to understand. And so I just want to say God loves you. He does. I think for me the most, I, I don't know about your highlight, but for me the highlight of this time has been so far, it's just been the father hug. That instruction that God gave and we just, just gave hugs. My goodness, I think we should do that on our time still. Like, like I, just, I just feel like that was so healing. Like, I could feel the healing on, in the church. And some of you, by the way, you will never be the same because of the hug you received. Yeah, you won't. There's, there's something that's even going to shift in your prayer life. You're going to find an ease in your prayer life. Yeah, you're going to find that you're no longer hiding and cowering around your father. Because he's your daddy. He loves you. He enjoys you. He wants you there. He wants you to have a sense of confidence about how you approach him. He doesn't want you to beg. Which child begs his father? 
if he has a good father. You don't beg your father. He, he, his are yours. Yeah. And if there's anything you're begging and he's not giving you, it's because it's not for you. <laughs> it's, it's not meant for you. Yeah. And that's who he is. So my prayer is that God will continue to reveal himself as a father this weekend. And that all of us will live with a completely different view of who our father is. And so if you're struggling, um, I want us to just keep leaning in. And I've really, I really have appreciated. There's some of you, we've had that conversation of, you know what? I hear, I hear here. It's not here. And it's so hard for me to get it here. And I love that you're being honest. I love that you're digging in. Because we do need, we can't force this thing. We have to actually come into the place where we say, God, reveal it to your people. And my prayer is that we'll just keep leaning in, keep having the conversation. This afternoon, I, I, I mean, one other thing that I just told my wife right now, I, I, I want to put out aside what I was going to talk about in the afternoon and maybe have an opportunity for us to just have a, a, a town hall, a conversation. Just sort of have a few of our pastors on stage and let's have a conversation about what, what are we struggling with? What are we learning? What are, we ex- what, are we, what, what, are the, what are you fearing for your compass? What are you fearing for your Or what are you excited about? What is God saying? Just have a time when we can prophesy, we can speak, we can ask, we can have a conversation. Is that a good thing? Yeah, yeah so we can, we can plan for that afternoon. You know, afternoon when the food is in your stomach, maybe that's what you need. It's an opportunity to air, air talk as opposed to just having a, have, having a talk. So that's what I, I just sense that that's what we're going to do this afternoon. But um, this morning, I want to uh, just continue in the conversation. Was that amazing yesterday? Yeah. Was Major Boki amazing? Was that something else? Like the army, I mean, I, I met a couple of people, they told me, I've ne- I, I'm not even sure I'm in an army now. I thought I was in an army, but I've understood what the army is. The army is something serious. It's easy to say army, but just to come to begin to understand, how does that translate to my faith? How does that translate to the way I take prayer? I, am I disciplined? Uh, am I proud of who I am? am I, do I have that army pride that I belong to the the king of kings. I'm a prince. I walk around. Do I walk around with that dignity of knowing who I am? Uh, And and all those things were just really, really powerful. Do I speak differently about my leaders? Uh, Oh, I have to say this one. Um, Allow me to embarrass uh, somebody. Uh, But Pastor Godwin, and uh, I mean, his... So so I have to tell you this story because these guys are ninjas. Uh, Pastor Godwin is a ninja, you know. And uh, I'm completely... So, so he, he, had, he had Major Boke, and that was his instruction. So I'm here talking to people, I'm hugging people. Then I looked around, I'm like, hey, I can see there are some guys who've decided they're not going home until the general goes. And it was getting late, people have all left. So I told my wife, we better go, because some people need to go home. So we went, and Pastor Godwin escorts me to the car with an entourage of the Lifeway Network. And then, no, that's not even the story. He comes back, and the whole Lifeway network is here waiting for him. And they say, we're not going home. I mean, no, they say, what do they say? Permission to go home, sir. <laughs> you know what, guys? I mean, I just want to commend you guys. You're an army. You're an, and you're modeling to us what an army is. And it didn't start yesterday. I've always, the executive team can tell you. I always, whenever I come from life, I always tell these guys, there's an army, there's an army rising up in life, in, in life. Way. And it's just, uh, uh, I don't know, there's just something amazing about that. And so I just want to appreciate you, sir. Well done. I love that. And the, the, what was crazy about it for me is it wasn't you, it was your people as well. And that people are just like, okay, we want to tarry, we want to learn. Uh, one of your daughters yesterday came up and because she tarried, and she, you told me her story, and, I, and we, I prophesied her husband over her. And the mother-in-law was standing right there. And so we decided, right there, the hookup was made. Numbers were exchanged. <laughs> right there, just tarrying, you know? Numbers were exchanged, and now we have got a divine hookup happening. That, 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 that uh, a certain son doesn't even know we have hooked him up. I mean, this is, man, I love the family. <laughs> Oh my, true story, true story, by the way. Wow. The blessing of sonhood. This is what we started with, Pastor Kev the Rev. Come on. That was amazing. And uh, he told us, your lifetime is too short for you to work for everything you need for your God purpose. God has such big things for you. If you are to work out, that you'll die before you get the equipping you need. 
and the gifts you need to achieve your purpose. And that's why God in His mercy helps you inherit some things. He puts people in your life to inherit some things. That's so powerful because Moses was supposed to lead a nation. I mean, that guy, if he waited for, his, for Am, Amrab and jo Joshebed, his mother, I mean, people you've never heard of, if he waited for them to give him the equipping to lead a million people out of slavery, he never would have gotten there. But God puts him in a, term, in a place where the king of the highest, the greatest nation of the earth becomes his father. Uh, he learns how to be a lawmaker. He learns how to be a ruler and a king. Uh, he learns all those things. And then God says, done, let's move to the next father. And God puts him in the house of the high priest uh, of, of Midian, Jethro. And in that place for another 40 years, he's taught how to look after stubborn sheep. Yeah, he's taught how to look after stubborn sheep in the wilderness that won't do what they're told. And that's what he needs to, he, to lead these million stubborn people into the wilderness. If he had waited in that house of his with the biological inheritance of his father, he would never have achieved his purpose. And that's what Pastor Kilonzi was teaching us. Your lifetime is too short. And God puts fathers for that purpose in your life. We talked about the fact that fathers lift the curse and release the blessing. You remember that one? That's the role of a father in your life, is to release the curse. Because the curse is there. The earth is already cursed. We are living under a curse. Everything around, you, around us is suffering from the effects of the curse. And the amazing thing is God says the hearts of sons have to be connected back to fathers. And the hearts of fathers have to be connected back to sons. And that's how the curse is lifted. And that's what they do. Number three, we talked about family is the key to discipleship movements. Remember that one? We said that family is that key, that middle key. Before that, you're just a traditional church creating members. But when you begin to indulge, engage in that place of family, then you find it makes it possible to become a global multiplying disciple-making movement, which is what Jesus sent us out to do, isn't it? He said, go and make disciples of nations. Yeah. Now, God is not saying, he wasn't saying that to just an abstract people. He's saying that to us. For us here, if we want to make disciples of nations, we can't do it by being a traditional church. We have to become a global movement. And that's why it's not an option. When people say, Pastor M, why are we doing this shift? It's not an option for us because God has already given us our mandate that we are supposed to turn ordinary people into fearless influencers of, this, of society and to plant culture-defining churches in all the capital cities of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. Man, we can't just sit here being a nice church and hope that happens. We have to become a movement because it's only movements that turn ordinary people into fearless influencers. You know, we, I think we're now beginning to understand what fearless influencers is. When we see <laughs> rappers <laughs> leading congregations, leading churches, business people leading churches. When, when Pastor George says, how many kingdom financials? I had so many people say, yay! <laughs> the ones who want to pay the, make the money to pay the pastor, <laughs> not to be the pastor. Come on, somebody. I'm just telling you right now. You're in the wrong church if that's what you're thinking. You will be a kingdom financial, but you will also be a pastor. <laughs> yeah, here we don't choose. Here we do all of them. That's what we do. Because we, this is, I mean, there's nobody who's just sitting there. Me, my work is just to send money for them to run ministry. We are all in ministry. This is what God has called us to be. And that's what happens when you become a family. And then we talked about number four. Jesus knew his identity and his authority. Remember that. That Jesus understood his identity and thus he had authority to speak difficult things into people's lives. To call out people who are busy who would, not follow, who would not have followed, but he had the authority to do that because he knew his identity. And we talked about actively seeking the graces of God that are in your family. There's some graces of God in your house. There's some God, graces of God in this house that is called Mavuno that you need to appropriate for yourself. You can't be saying those are things for our leaders. Those are things for Pastor M. No, they are your blessings. Just like if you're in, your, in, in a biological family, the blessings of your parents are your blessings. They're your blessings. You receive them. You don't earn them. They're yours. So actively appropriate the blessings in your, in your family. Appropriate the blessings in your network. Appropriate the blessings in your compass, through your compass pastor. And then number two, also you need to call out blessings in the life of your disciples. You know, you have to start becoming a bold leader. You know, the one reason that people are not bold leaders is because they're not bold followers. If you find that you struggle to lead people, 
you don't have the confidence to call out things these people, it's because you yourself have not understood the secret of following. Because when you start following hard, then you'll have no fear. You'll have no fear. Once you start following, once it becomes, I'm in, I'm 100% in, you stop having fear. Uh, look at the disciples. Before they were in 100%, they were fearful people. They were running away. They are disowning Jesus. Then Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And Peter is restored. And at that point, Holy Spirit comes. And the next thing you're hearing is Peter saying, silver and gold I have none, but such as I have. I mean, the man knows his identity and authority. He's not saying such as Jesus has. He's saying such as who has. Come on, somebody, you have something in you. That's you. You have an identity and an authority. And you need to call it out in the lives of people. Uh, you, you should not be afraid to say to people, come on, join this discipleship group and it will make you something. Yeah. You shouldn't be afraid to call out the gifts of the people in your group. To say, I see in you greatness. I see something amazing in you. I see something. Praying for them. When you pray, by the way, God gives you words for your disciples. And these pastors can all tell you, I've called them out. I've spoken things into their life and they've come to pass. As I've sought the Father, the Father has shown me things about them. All of them. And they're becoming something they would never have become if they were not following me. You have the authority to do that. And you need to appropriate that. And then number five, we talked about the fact that we follow our leader's commands and we command our disciples. How commandable are you? <laughs> How commandable are you? Are you a commander? And I could see some people really getting uncomfortable yesterday. Was, that was a bit uncomfortable, isn't it? Because as human beings, we, are, we, are, we don't start off as commandable. You try and teach your, the two words that all children I know struggle with are what? Sorry? <laughs> uh -huh. To teach, no, to teach them to say. Please and sorry. I don't know why. Like a kid can learn any other word. Mommy, mommy, daddy, dad. <laughs> Please. <laughs> like they know what that word means. They know it means I go down. I humble myself. Have you noticed that with kids? Yeah. Parents are the ones who are looking at me like they know what I'm talking about. The rest of you have forgotten because it was a long time since you were a child. But I, I wondered. It's like, why are they struggling? Just say please. Say, just say sorry. <laughs> it's like you're begging them. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. kids, kids really struggle with those. It's because we're not born commandable. Wow. We're not born commandable. Somebody has to teach you to be commandable. And that's why Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Yeah. Jesus didn't say, te teaching them to maybe, <laughs> maybe accept the commands. Perhaps. No. Peradventure. <laughs> I love you, Pastor Kilo. <laughs> so good. He didn't teach them that. He says, teach them to obey. And the disciples had no problem with that because Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ command those under you to do these things. They understand that their work is to teach people to obey. And so you, if you're not commandable, you're not a disciple. This for me, by the way, is a take. It's like you're not a disciple. You may think you are, but you're not a disciple. Because if you cannot be commanded by the leader that Jesus has put in your life, how dare you say that Jesus can command you? You can't. You know, it's just one of those things. You notice in the army, I mean, Major Boke just brought it out for us. You can't say, I don't obey the sergeant because me, I obey the general. That's a lie. <laughs> You're just in the court martial right there. Some of us are facing heavenly court martial, you know, because it's like, I want to obey Jesus, but I can't obey any human authority. That is rebellion against heaven. I mean, you cannot live like that. None of us was built to live like that. And then number six with Major Boke. Wasn't this amazing? Know the commander's intent. Aish! Even I was learning something there. It's like, what's the intent? Yeah, what does this, it's like, what does this commander want? And you know, it's interesting because your, your leader always has the big picture. That's what I find. It's like God entrusts your leader with a big picture. You have a piece of the picture, and the piece that you have is, it's a perfect piece, but it's a piece. And many times when I talk to people, even people who come and tell me, Pastor M, oh, this happened to me, or I was hurt in this way at Mavuno, or this. And many times I'm able to say, that's the part you saw. But there's a much bigger piece that you are not aware of. There were other things that were going on that you couldn't see. It's just the reality. When you are the leader, and many of you are leaders of organizations, so you know what I'm talking about. When you are the CEO of something, 
You are the one who doesn't sleep when everybody else is sleeping. When there are no salaries, only one person is not sleeping. Hi, there are no entrepreneurs in the house. <laughs> this, all your employees are snoring hard. They don't even know where salaries will come from. But you're the one who's losing sleep, Pastor Kelvin. You're the one calling Pastor M and saying, Pastor M, this month, things are thick for my people. Yeah, it's you. The rest of your people, they don't even know you're having that conversation. Yeah. Please, can I, can I pay? Can you, can you allow me? You know, it's like, he's it's like, please, my people have to be paid. That's, it's, only, it's only the person at the top who understands the big picture. And so you need to know their intent. And Major Boke was brilliant in showing us how you do that in the army. And I believe that in the church army, we must understand that, yes, I'm a person under authority. I'm, I'm here representing an authority. And when I represent that authority and I understand that authority, then I'm able to represent well. And so he, talked, he, talked to, he taught us that, that fact, that being an army takes discipline, confidence in who we are, and appreciating our leaders. Oh my goodness, this has been so good. I feel like, you know, that mountain top where you're like, my goodness, it's like you can camp there and just appreciate the lessons we've learned. We talked about this other diagram, which I think was just uh, something that was shared with me by a pastor. By the way, the pastor Lincoln who shared this, He's a brilliant, brilliant, like I've, I've rarely met a brilliant leader like this man. Uh, he's a Ugandan, uh, you know Pastor Lincoln Soronga, Ugandan who, was, who leads a church in the UK. He's actually going to be here in uh, March, March 16th to 18th, we're doing what we call the Ndoa Festival. And it's basically going to, going to be a time to, we just thought we need to empower the marriages of the church because marriages in this country are in trouble. And we cannot be the same as the people in the world around us. And so we're, what we're going to do in that time is we're going to actually have, like Thursday will just be for pastors. Uh, like, like, you know, the devil is so smart. Strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. So we want to do one. If you know pastors in this city, if you've got a friend who's a pastor who's somewhere accessible, we want to do this thing just for them. He's going to be speaking with his wife. And we just want to point to pastors' marriages on Thursday. Thursday, uh, 17th, we're going to do uh, uh, just dating couples, married couples, evening dinner, gala dinner. And then on Saturday, we're going to do it here at Hill City. It's going to be a gathering. And it's just going to be a full, full day of teaching. Why am I saying that? I think it's because I got... He, so, so, get this. I taught about movements. And then, and Pastor Carol can testify, and Pastor James was there. And then he, he was drawing something. And then he comes up on stage. and So, every talk I gave... He would come up afterwards, and then he would say, oh my goodness, that was a brilliant talk. Here's what I learned. And then you'd be like, I said it like that. Like, he's a guy who says something and you think, I, don't even, I didn't even know I was that brilliant. Like, 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 you learned from me. And he actually shared this diagram. He said, this is what Pastor M is teaching us. And I was like, can I borrow your diagram back? Can I take what I taught you back? And so he taught us about, yeah, these are what happens. You know, traditional church, attendance and membership. That's where we get stuck. And then family, army, movement. That's where Jesus starts. Jesus doesn't even start with membership. He doesn't say, come, follow me, and I'll make you a member. And you can tithe to my ministry. He doesn't start there. He starts with follow me and become my child. Come, follow me and, become, and be with me. And then after that, I will send you out as an army to change the world. And attendance, someone who comes to church, their main desire is to be fed and to be inspired, and to be blessed. They come to church for blessings. And there's nothing wrong with coming to church for blessings. Many of you have been there. There's a season in your life when everybody is there. But then after that, what happens is a member, someone goes beyond attending, now is serving and giving of their resources. They are blessed. I also need to be a blessing. And members are able to sign up and to start serving, to start giving in that place. But family goes to the next level. Jesus started at the family level. A planted disciple. Come on, somebody. That is somebody who is planted. They're not there because it's a good church, because they moved, because they know they're in the neighborhood, it's convenient. No, they're there because that's their family. They recognize their leader as their spiritual parent. And they're also learning how to parent others. They're also learning to make disciples. And so a family member is a disciple maker of necessity. And then the army. The army is the next level. Because the army is that same disciple when they become commandable. When they become commandable. When I move to the place where now I'm not just here because I, I'm, I'm loved. I'm accepted. I have an identity. I'm here because I'm commandable. I'm part of an army. And there's a mission. And that is my mission as well. I'm disciplined 
and I'm commandable. And then movement is when the army goes out into society. That's what starts to happen and starts creating new discipleship families and starts taking over sectors of society, starts creating in, uh, uh, small parts of the kingdom, wherever it is, whether it's in banking, whether it is in media and entertainment, whether it's in other countries, that these people now commandable are able to go and be people under authority who now command others. And that's what we were learning uh, in that diagram. And we, we talked about the fact, this connects very well with what I've been teaching about in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Because it talks about, for us, to move from traditional church to biblical, disip uh, biblical discipleship movement, it's that three-step process. Create a family, teach them to follow, turn them into an army. Do you guys remember that? So this is just, a sim it's just connecting with where we've been uh, in the past. Uh, Turn them into an army. Join me with me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So I'm hoping that things are beginning to fall together. When God began to give me this revelation, uh, I remember we talked to Apostle Moses and he was like, let's go, you're the army. But I remember just looking back at 2 Timothy and saying, we're not even a family yet. Um, he, he already, just because of the way their church formed, they have a very unique history. They formed as a, a, a music team. A college music team. They were all college buddies when they started their church. And as a result, they grew a church that was built on those relationships. Like everybody was related to everybody else. Everybody married everybody else's cousin and all that. I'm mean, sorry, I, if, if you're watching this, that sounds bad. But actually the reality is there's just such a closeness. And so when God gave them the revelation, they were able to charge. But for me, it dawned on me, we don't have family. We're a great church. We're a phenomenal church. We have incredible members. We even have army members, but we lack family. An army without family is individuals who are about to be killed. Yeah, it's people who are just vulnerable. Frontline initiatives that are out there just waiting to be assassinated because they don't have backup. And so God convicted me and I, I said, I have to take the time to build a family. And we spoke with our pastors, we agreed on that. And I want to say praise God for the family of Mavuno Church. Like there's a family in every campus of Mavuno Church now. And it's obvious, it's tangible, it's real. Uh, it's not abstract, it's people and it's beautiful. But you know, God then says, okay, now that you've got the family, come on, teach them how to follow. And that's why this year our theme is following hard. Like we're learning how to follow. This year we're going to be learning, it's boot camp, we're going to be learning how to follow. And we're going to be listening to Jesus as he teaches us how to follow. Now, does that mean we stop being a family? Nope. No. The army, is the, army. the army is the family. Which means that everything we're doing as a family, we keep doing even more. We have even more reason to love each other. Yeah, I loved you because Jesus said, but now I love you because you're, my life depends on it. Yeah, if, if, I, if I'm alone here, if I'm, if I'm in Jackie's discipleship group and I don't love her, she could, I, could, I could be dead. She's my backup. She's the one when we're in the field who cannot leave me behind in the, in the field. Uh, we're, we're even closer because we understand we need each other. Uh, and that's, so, the, so the family thing, by the way, I want to see that continuing to deepen in our churches. Uh, I, want to, I want to see us loving people as they come in. I want to see people walking into a Mavuno church and it's like, my goodness, I can't believe the level of love people have for each other in this campus. By our love for one another, they, they will know that our Father has sent us. So that will never change. In fact, it should continue getting deeper every day, deeper every year. But I want us to sort of talk about then this movement thing. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Um, and, and, and this is Luke writing about Jesus, uh, writing the, the book of Acts. And he says, the former account I made, O Theophilus. So Luke is writing uh, to a rich guy, who's called Theophilus, who actually sponsors him. Those days, uh, paper was expensive. You couldn't just be a writer because you wanted to be a writer. Nowadays, we have the Fearless Institute. Everybody writes a book. Uh, but come on, somebody. We have so many authors. By the way, let me just see authors of Mavuno Church, people who've written a book. Come, can you see? Like, these, are, these are serious ninjas. I mean, all these guys, like we have so many authors. I can't believe the, the biggest concentration of authors in Nairobi is right here. Right here. Come on, somebody. And it's about to get bigger because all of you guys who are joining. 
you know, uh, all of you are going to write your own books and books. Not Some of these guys are multiple uh, book authors, which is amazing. So those days you needed to get a sponsor because materials were expensive. You needed a rich person to sponsor you. So when Luke, Dr. Luke, who was one of Paul's disciples, decided to write the story of Jesus, a, a rich Christian named Theophilus is the one who sponsored the work and paid for it. And so he says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, he's writing the story of Jesus and he addresses this guy as an honor. You know how you write a forward? And you say, this book is only possible because of, this is what Luke is doing when he mentions this guy's name. And he says, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Like Jesus was taken up only after he had given. <laughs> Have you ever noticed, I mean, it's like interesting. Sometimes I wonder, how come I read scripture all these years and I missed all this? It's only after he had given commandments. Wow. Yeah. And when he gave the commandments, he was taken up. How commandable are you? Yeah. Jesus commanded his disciples because they were his disciples. And, and, and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 13, uh, Paul says, and he's talking to the people in the church of Thessalon uh, Thessalon Thessalonica, Thess Thessalonica. <laughs> Come on, somebody. That's... Amen. <laughs> and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. That word, urge, you know, that's a word of please, guys. Here he's not even commanding, he's like, please, guys, I implore you. I, I, I need you to do this. He's just showing you it's not easy to be commandable. It's not easy to be commandable. He's, he's like, he's begging them, guys, I need you to do this thing for me. It's like when you ask your teenage son to bathe. You know, it's like, I urge you. I was one, once, once upon a time. It's like, why am I bathing? You know, I'm like, I, I feel good. <laughs> I, I bathed like two days ago. And, and I've been fresh all along, you know. Yeah, just the other day I was bathing, you know. <laughs> it's like, I urge you, my son, please, in view of God's mercy, please take a bath. <laughs> it's like you have to beg the person. And Paul's like, I urge you guys. This thing is good for you. You need to esteem them highly. And then he says, those to labor among you and are over you in the Lord. What a shock. You know, we are all equal in Jesus' eyes, aren't we? So how is it then that there are people who are over us? Like again, it's like, how come I never saw this in Scripture? That God actually appoints people to be over you in the Lord. So, as we said yesterday, I mean, there are people who understood this. John says to his cousin, his younger cousin, I'm not worthy to tie his shoelaces. He understands this man is over me in the Lord. My blessing flows from him, not the other way around. Even though I am John. And I, I, I'm sure everybody was confused. Huh? I mean, it's John the Baptist. He's the prophet. He's the guy everybody has come. Even Pharisees have, have shut down the temple to come and hear his stories. Our tax collectors are there. Roman soldiers are there. Everybody is there. And then in the middle of the sermon, he sees Jesus. And he's like, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> he's like, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's like in shock. I'm not even worthy. Like his disciples were confused. And then people come and say, Jesus is bapti he's baptizing people. And John is like, he must become greater. I must become. My goodness, John understood something spiritual. That there's someone over me in the Lord. So this is the issue that we're all called to follow. But I want to ask us a question. Why is it so hard to follow? What are the reasons that it's so hard? What makes following so hard. Again, we're going to have a conversation. Let's just have a chat with your neighbor. What, what, like, like, like for you, what makes following hard? What are the things that makes following so hard? And even as you're listening to this conversation we're having, some of you have had struggles, personal struggles as you're listening to this. You're, you, you're understanding it here, but it's not here. What makes it so hard for you? And what do you think makes it hard for others to have this conversation? So introduce yourself to your neighbor if you don't know them. Let's have a bit of a conversation. List, list a few things. I want us to have a conversation about this. 
I want us to reason together. What makes it so hard to follow? What makes following so hard for us as God's people? I hope my guys with mics are understanding that that's their cue. Um, so for me, something that sticks out about um, what, what makes following hard is lack of faith. Because you are stepping into a space, you don't know what to expect or what comes ahead of you. Yeah. So that lack of having faith in the person you're following, what's going to happen to you, the uncertainty, yeah. And the fear of not knowing uncertainty. Because we like to be in control, isn't yeah. it? And already when you're the one leading, it's already hard enough to have full control. Yeah. Now you are asking someone else to lead. Yeah. That means even less control, isn't it? Anybody feel that one? Yeah, absolutely. There's someone over there standing, yeah. All right. Um, in our group we discussed, and uh, uh, we loved where you began by saying, kids, I mean, from a young age, saying things like, please, thank you, you literally squeeze it out of them. Yeah. And I mean, as a parent, I've experienced the same. <laughs> so um, the other thing is that independence is celebrated and rewarded greatly in our culture. Yeah. Um, I, I was once speaking with one of our teenagers at Lovington, and she's 14, and she, she, she was saying, I can't wait to leave my father's home, get an ID, and I felt pity for her. Yeah. Uh, because she, she was like, I finally will do what I want. Yeah. I'm like, uh, you we, I wish you knew better. I wish you could enjoy being a child. Yes, I wish you could be enjoying. <laughs> and I told her, adulting is a scam. This thing of being independent is a scam. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. <laughs> it's a lie. Um, so independence is celebrated and, uh, and, and rewarded greatly in our culture. Yeah. So we don't have people who are modeling following. Wow. People want to do things their way. Everything we're taught says get independent. Come on, Pastor Timo. That's so awesome. All right. I, was there somebody else? You need to move from there. You've got people on this side also. Oh, you're, you're both in the same point. So make sure somebody's over there. Okay. Uh huh. Gentleman with the mic. Okay. What makes following so hard is also uh, religious or doctrinal differences. Mm. For example, for me, I pray at a church called the church called God's Last Appeal Church. It's a Sabbath church. Yeah. So we have very strict guidelines and uh, rules that any other person will come here and feel very uncomfortable. Mm. But we are forgetting that Christianity is a family, irrespective of where we worship. Yeah. So sometimes religious and doctrinal differences may make it hard to uh, uh, follow, to be commandable. Thank Inter you. Interesting. Wow. That's a great insight. Thank you. Uh, I want to I'm making sure there's somebody on this side. I can see, I can see so many hands. You're not seeing them? Oh, so, sorry. Oh, okay. Let us speak then. I, 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 we're, we're, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I'll let okay, you. Okay, yeah. this is a quick one. My name is Wangesh Kanyaki. I was uh, sharing with Pastor Maisha of Kiambu, Magno uh, Kiambu, and we say that uh, what, what you're saying that the reason we find it hard to follow is because of fear of losing control. Yeah. And it's also rooted in a lack of trust, especially mm. if you have been hurt before or you have seen an example, you don't want to go down that road. Yeah. And uh, one of the things you said, I asked him, how do you know when I'll, your people are not following? And something he said was, you know, just reluctance, you've been given a task and you're delaying and not getting it done is some of the way that it shows reluctance in as a follower. Wow, wow. You know, it's so interesting what you say because we have a, a, a cultural suspicion of leadership. And it's not just of parental leadership, it's government leadership, church leadership, uh, leadership of institutions, business leadership. We just live in a culture of suspicion against leadership and media blows up all leadership failure which has made us very afraid to trust and be those victims when the leaders implode. 
And that's a really very powerful one that you've just shared. All right, someone standing over here. Yeah, so we're sharing with my wife. Uh, Come on. <laughs> Come on, wife. <laughs> <laughs> I choose life. Look, <laughs> um, so two things came out. One, uh, fear of being at the mercy of someone. Yeah. In as much as you trust mm -hmm. them, uh, you're not sure what they are going to do next. Yeah. You know. Uh, then the second so one. So like being controlled by someone. Yes. Uh, if they lose lose sight of the mark, uh, it may be a bit late before you find out, uh, and you may have. Uh, so fear drifted. of being uh, diverted, yes. misled. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the second one was. Uh, uh, we believe that God has given us some brilliant minds that are firing in all pistons. <laughs> and then you put it in the bag. The yes. Bag. <laughs> so, so <laughs> why, why, why was it here? Eh? Eh, why were we given it if, uh, if it was not to be used? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Why would God give me such a sharp mind and an opinionated opinion and then not expect me to use it? Yeah. I hear that argument sometimes when people say, why would God give me such good, uh, such a handsome body and good functioning organs and then he doesn't want me to sleep around? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Let's move around because that's not the topic of the day. That's, but, I, but, but yeah, but the point is valid, however. I have a sharp mind. I have a good way of thinking. And then you want me to stop using it? Yeah. At, at our group, we had two. I think the first one is we've all been working to lead. Yes. We enter this, if it's an organization, if it's work, you start from the bottom. And all you're working your way up is to, be is the to leader. have people following you. Yeah. yeah. Then why am I following? <laughs> <laughs> See, I lived here to, I came here, I mean, I worked hard to be followed. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to start. I following. love it. And maybe I'm even being followed outside there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think the second one was uh, in line with what uh, Pastor Calvin said. But I can see. You know, if the leader just took this route, why is it taking us this way? We can go faster this By way. By going this way. You know that thing where uh, Major Bok was saying, yeah, stop thinking. Put my, was it, uh, there was a bug. Where put you your put brain in the kit bag. <laughs> yeah, but it's here and it, I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see. Maybe sometimes my leader is not as fast as me. They're not as, as trained as me. Maybe I've even gotten training. Uh, I've been taught strategic thinking, project management, all those important things. The leader has no such clue about such things. So I can see they don't have it. And now they're giving, making commands and decisions that I can see are, this is not the way to do it. I could tell you five other ways that are better than the one you've just given us. What do you do in that situation? All right, uh, you're standing up over there. Good morning, Mavuno. Good morning, Lily. I'm a good uh, public speaker. I have a good memory. Come on. <laughs> I'm not anxious. Yeah. And I'm working in ease and acceleration, spiritual fitness. I love and those declarations. Impact. Come on. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So our group talked about um, control, fear, and a couple of many accountability yeah. and relationships. Uh, the one I would like to speak about is personally, I feel like leaders need to earn our following. You know, because uh, Jesus is perfect, but humans err, and we don't know where they're going to lead us today. Today they're saying this, so I need to see your track record. Bring your bank statement. Let's see <laughs> how, you're <do> how you're doing. You know, let's let's see. And I need to be able to to follow. It's easy for me to follow my husband and submit to him yeah. because I have seen that he loves me and puts me ahead of himself. You, he has a track record. He has a track record. Wow. Now, other people who, you know, we now all of a sudden we have to follow them and, you wow. know, and remove, you know, stop being opinionated and yeah. just follow. It's difficult to be able to, to, to kind of process that. Wow. Uh, thank That's you. That's so powerful. <laughs> That's so powerful. Lily, I wish I could ask you, like, how was your marriage before your husband had earned the track record? If it wasn't for our grandfather and our <laughs> grandmother, we would not be here today. It was very bad. <laughs> wow. All right. Thank God for husbands who have earned the track record. At the very back, <laughs> yeah. there are some who are sitting right now saying, God, one day. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mavuno. Good morning. I'm William from Mavuno Karen. Come on, Mavuno Karen. And what you have just discussed here with my friends is that what makes following so hard is that Yes, you have a leader, 
But this leader, sometimes, you know, the behavior of somebody is your answer. When this leader <laughs> behaves like he's not leading you, he's leading you astray, you know, you just find an answer that he's not the right leader. Yeah. So you'll be tempted to follow him or try to look for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. another thing is trust, like somebody mentioned there. Yeah. You, you yeah. trust this guy, but yes, following him, you're still struggling. Wow. And, and, and I think what you're pointing out is so powerful, William, because you're saying that sometimes we can see our leaders are human. The person who have been asked to lead me, I, I can see their flaws. Because you can't pretend. You can, you can act, maybe you even know them from the past. And I can tell this person has issues. And then I'm supposed to follow them. And I think you're absolutely right. That, that's a huge uh, stumbling block when we're supposed to be leading. All right. Uh, we've got a couple more. Uh, are you standing to talk? No. Uh, who was standing? Okay, Pastor James. Yes, Pastor James. Um, oh, I was asking whether you're standing. Okay, oh. all right. And then you looked at me like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm just stretching. <laughs> okay, so Come on, Mato. Uh, a few things. So uh, uh, when you're talking about the guys... Yeah, yeah, put it pretty close to your mouth, yeah. When you're talking about the guys who don't want to be asked to lead a church. Eh? I was telling Pastor Shu, I don't want to sit in the second row because <laughs> you, you might be touched and then uh, decide to give me the grace of church planting. Eh? <laughs> so, so, so I sat on the first one. Eh? Anyway, don't want to so, be too close. <laughs> so so b back to our discussion. Eh? We, we all grew up uh, watching this series, uh, 24. Eh? Mm. And, and Jack Bauer... If even the president says something that he doesn't agree with, yeah, he does what he wants, eh? yeah. And then yeah. he was like the hero of the of the series every uh, up to like season I don't know eleven. As in, it, so that is what we grew up wow. thinking that this is the guy. Eh? Yeah. So when you're telling us now, uh, no, 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 put it in the bag. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> that, that becomes an issue. Eh? Yes. Uh, the second that is thing. So so true. The second thing is okay. I'll say what nobody else wants to say. Yeah. But say it. every cult that ever started. Yeah. Started here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Why, does, why don't people want to say that? It's the truth. Cults follow. Cults follow. Yeah, they do. And that's really powerful. And Jack Bauer doesn't. And he always wins. And I'd rather be Jack Bauer than a cult. <laughs> Yeah, Pastor James. Um, I've, I've struggled. I don't know whether it's the right word, but I'm going to say intellect. Mm. And that the fact that I'm intelligent sometimes makes it hard for me to follow because my intellect says to me, but can I trust? So that then uh, Pastor Lily from Mavuno Kigali, when she says, do you have a track record? That's a very intelligent thought. Yeah. It's, you know, there's nothing, there's no fault in that logic. So uh, the reason I've, I've been trying to figure out what the word is is because, uh, you know, as we've been having this following, con following conversation with some of the people around me, uh, one of the things we've really talked about is, you know, an, an, an instruction has come in the last few weeks, your cameras must be on. And so I've been in many conversations about, okay, why? And, and we're not getting it, but, you know, we were praying, uh, you know, I'm up at 4.30. Why isn't that enough? I was already praying I'm seeking the Lord. I'm in, yeah. you know. And, and that feels like a more spiritual instruction. Yes, to wake up I, and I can pray. probably agree to that one. Yeah. But the video is not in the Bible. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, somehow I, my intellect tells me that God can see me with my video off. Yeah. <laughs> so what's with this thing with the video? Um, so, so my intellect helps me remember that maybe I followed and I was hurt in the past. Maybe I trusted and I was wounded in the past. And all those things come in the way. So the thing that shocked me is that I've had this conversation with a number of people who, who just had a struggle and they're close enough to me that they asked the question. They said, I'm not getting this thing. Yeah. And many times it was because there's someone we are leaving behind uh, because of this instruction. What does this mean for them? Why are we locking them out of prayers? The interesting thing for me is that for all these people, because you know, they're they are relatively close to me, with each of them I was able to say to them, the way we are being taught to follow isn't this how you're already following me? So that then now, because there's an instruction that has come, I think our intellect gets in the way 
and I realize these guys, and you know, they are here because that's how they follow. They follow closely. They, f they are following hard already, but it's like they hadn't even noticed that they are already following hard. Yeah. It's like now when it becomes, they engage, it engages with our intellect zone, we're like, it seems wrong, it seems I might get hurt, it seems I might be abused or misused. But for, 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 <laughs> for pretty much all of them, I was able to illustrate and say, but this is how you follow me. I've given instructions without, you know, without context. Without, you've think, done it, without, without saying follow me. Without casting vision, without, yeah, and without saying follow me. And I'm like, but you did this and you did this and you did this. For some of them, I've been able to say, if I ask you to do this, you know, for one of them, I said, if I asked you to quit your job today, would you? And, and they said, yes. And I said, would it be really, really hard? And they said, yes. And I said, you're already following me. Why are you struggling? Because now the instruction, the struggle is because the instruction has come. That's why I'm saying, I don't know if intellect is right or not, but I think it's at a mind level that it's struggling, that the struggle exists, but at some point, deep down, it's like there's a conviction that this is how I should follow my spiritual leader. Yeah, wow. but it clashes with what's, with in what's the inside head. the head. Interesting. Alison, yeah, thank you, Pastor James. Yeah, the intellect gets in the way. How many smart people in the house? <laughs> yeah, they're here. I love Mavunites, by the way. They don't actually humble, humble. Aha, uh -huh. me, I'm smart. Yeah, and you better know it. <laughs> Alison. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Hi, Alison. My name is Annabelle, and I'm from Mavuna Lifeway. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I think for me personally, the war uh, within my soul has been raging ever since I came for the gathering. Mm. And I think following hard is so difficult because maybe also some people growing up, you had a parent that controlled you, yeah. even using money. And at the time, it didn't um, sink in your mind that if you behave well, you're gifted money. And so if you are not a good uh, kid, then you're, it's taken away. And so some people say they wish they could go back and become kids but there are people who are here who are so happy to be independent and out of that situation. Wow. So then for us to be dragged back to being dependent and having a father and saying this person is my father, it's so painful, it's yeah. so difficult. Yeah. And then yeah. also yeah. another issue is the issue of money. I mean, for me, I think like every situation always goes back to money. Um, <laughs> Because like if you're if you're independent and you're seeking after your career, I'm an animator. That's what I do for a living. So I hustle, right? So I don't. Yeah. Ha I'm not employed. So I hustle. So now me, I'm thinking <laughs> today, this week, I'm um, out hustling, and then Pastor Godi is like, Annabelle, I need you to go to this school because we are doing Mizizi, and I need you to come with me because I need someone to come with me. Now I'm like. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm already struggling like to, to give up and that surrender is a lot harder yeah. when finally you feel like I have my independence, I have control over myself, I, I don't need anyone to tell me what to do because I feed myself now yeah. and then now you're being told put that aside, forget all that, follow hard. It's really wow. so difficult. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that by the way. Um, that's really, re that's, thanks for keeping it real. Yeah, I mean, it feels like being dragged back to a place I walked my way out of. And I felt so good to be out, and now it just feels like a nightmare being pulled back into where I was. Thank you for that. Uh, there was somebody on this side before I get past the shoe here. And there's somebody at the back as well. Sorry, I don't want to ignore the people at the back. Sometimes they feel like second-class citizens, and you're not. <laughs> so, so, so should you just allow them to share. Uh huh. Make sure it's on. Guys, I hope you are resonating with some of these things. And, I, and, and when we share, by the way, take notes as well. Because these are the th as, you, as you hear the objections of people, they may not be your objection, but it will be the objection of somebody in your discipleship group. So for me, I'm actually recording because I want to hear what you think. And I'm learning as well because these are not things that I know. Uh, they're not my experience, uh, all the experiences being shared. Uh huh. Good morning, Avuna. Morning. So... Most of the things that I share with my neighbor have been shared by most people. So this just came to me as people are sharing. Um, I think sometimes we, following also means like when you follow, you become a disciple. And like you said, we are not born knowing how to follow. Yeah. We are taught. So sometimes we lack to follow because of lack of knowledge. So mentorship, you yeah. don't trust anyone. 
to mentor you because you need to be taught to follow. Yeah. yeah. So lack Follow of knowledge, so. basically. Yeah. It's about yeah. to make it very hard. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and, and say your campus name so that the people in your campus can be very proud of you. All right. At the very back there. Okay. Um, so two things. Number one. Two, two, com two campuses or your, which, which campus? Oh, oh. Uh, my name is Dagi and I'm representing. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Someone is, anyway, I'm kidding. Um, I'm representing Mabuna Kare. Come on. <laughs> um, so two things. Number one uh, that my sister said was not knowing the commander's intent, like not knowing what your leader is intending. So you feel like, like a soldier waiting. You're like, where are we going? What are we doing? And then like, if they're not communicating fast enough or they're not communicating, then you kind of feel like, okay, how do I follow if I don't know? Yeah. Um, the second thing was if when I'm a follower, I, I really, Yanni, I've loved that hierarchy. It's made so much sense of like so many things. But like when, let's say if one of the leaders is still kind of a member, you know, an attendee, and you're probably an army. So like, it feels like this is not making sense. You know, yeah, like they're, yeah. not, they're not in the mental state of an army already. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, okay, that I'm not speaking specifically about Mabuno. I'm just saying like from experiences I've had elsewhere. Yeah. Like, if they're not in the army setting, like you feel so vulnerable because you're out there, you're a soldier, but you don't have covering because your leader has settled in, in the membership um, ah. mindset. So oh, you feel so vulnerable. And I felt that in so many spaces. Since we're being vulnerable, I felt that in so many spaces because I'm an Ethiopian, I grew up in Kenya, so I have both cultures in me, you know? Yeah. So I get lost, honestly speaking. Like I feel so lost. Why am I getting emotional? <laughs> this is wrong. It's supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation, not with everybody. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it's so, Yanni Pasi, it's so hard. Because yeah. yeah. for me, I have a passion for ministry. But I can't be boxed in either space. You know? So when I get, when I get to some spaces, I'm like, there's, there's, more, there's something more that's, that's calling. Yeah. But then finding a leader that can speak into that for me, um, has been such a struggle, especially wow. in the Ethiopian setting. Yeah. Because the Ethiopian setting sometimes, um, I know you guys know the Ethiopians in Isli, you know, pockets. We, we just stick together and drink coffee, which is so irrelevant for ministry. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, it's such a time-wasting ex... Okay, it's lovely, though. The coffee is sweet. <laughs> I'm gonna... yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's been such a struggle for me because I'm like, how do I... And I know that there are cross-cultured Ethiopians like me, Kids who've grown up in Kenya, kids like Ethiopian kids that have grown up in different nations across the globe. Like wow. there are people like, even in Iceland there's an Ethiopian community drinking coffee, you guys. My it's goodness. actually depressing. Yeah. <laughs> but they, like the kids need like the, that generation needs people to speak into them. Like they need people to rise up for them. But then we're being told, no, 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 keep it Amharic, don't sing other languages. You know, like we're yeah. being boxed so much. It's so frustrating, but I'm grateful to God that there's, there's a lady who actually went, like lived in Kenya and now is in the US and she's so cross-cultured, but she's in her 50s that has finally become my mentor. Nice. But it took so many years to get that one person that wow. gets me that I can actually follow hard. Wow. So I wow. thank God for that. Thank you, Pastor Dagi. Dagi is a, a, a worship, worship leader at Mavuno Karen and uh, an amazing woman. And you know what? I think you're... It's not, a, it's not just a cross-cultural issue there because what the issue is, is what happens when I'm in a space where my leader is not where I am? I'm ready for big things, but my leader is at a very safe space. And that's another danger. And then I'm supposed to follow this person who's not as on fire as I am for the things that I sense God is saying we do. It's not a legitimate thing. It can happen whether you're in a cross-cultural context or not. And actually, even on this, even just this week, a couple of people have come up to me with that exact same uh, issue. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, right at the back. Um, good morning, Mavuno. Uh, my name is Joanne from Mavuno Downtown. <laughs> um, one of the things we talked about is um, that uh, why it's hard to follow is that familiarity. For instance, if your DG leader um, you're in the same class in campus, for instance, <laughs> or um, um, like let's say you're the same age, yeah. Um, it, there's that level of familiarity that you had before they became a leader and it becomes difficult to follow. I love that. Yeah, so true. The, the second thing that's actually quite very real for me is 
Um, sometimes, um, I think first time you'd mentioned that when you just simply obey and um, you're told become a DG leader and you're like, good, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. There's blessings that follow you. So in that particular setting, you find that, um, let's say you, in, in your DG or in that setting, they feel that um, you're undeserving mm. of the blessings that come. So why should I follow, you know? Wow. Or, um, or you feel that, um, so it becomes difficult to follow. Just translate that for like, oh, as you, best as not, you can. <laughs> you're, not, um, you're not worthy of the vegetables. Worthy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't qualified. That's a better way. Yeah. And, and sometimes, to be honest, in the church setting, sometimes it's very easy to follow because you've, you, 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 you're in church, for instance. Yeah. But you know, um, God just didn't talk about church. It's also an, em an employment. Yeah. You have a horrible boss, and you're being told to honor this person. Yeah. You're like, you know, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. Or yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, leadership in, in the country. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the last election was very divisive. Yeah. But then again, there's a president who's been chosen. And so what, do you, what happens when you are passionate about the opponent, yeah. and now this person has to become your commander in chief? Wow. So those kind of things are what makes it They're real. They're very real. Thank you so much. Let's appreciate Let's appreciate Joanne. You know, it's interesting, um, when you shared that story about familiarity, I thought about, um, I don't know if I should say this, um, I, I thought of, <laughs> I say, <laughs> you know, Pastor Kilonzi and Pastor Kelvin were classmates in campus. And now Pastor Kilonzi, uh, Pastor Kelvin gets the privilege of calling Pastor Kilonzi his spiritual father. I mean, how messed up is that? I mean, like God has a, must have a sense of humor somewhere. Like we were boys. We went out to meet. We did things together. We have, like we were the same. And now I'm supposed to look up to you as a spiritual authority. And you're right. That can be confusing. It can be very confusing. Sometimes it's not even somebody the same level. Sometimes somebody who was below you or behind you. And so uh, Pastor Tosh, I always respect him because he was my senior in school. And so now he's supposed to call me his spiritual authority. I mean, we went to those highly regimented, hierarchical schools where when a senior like Pastor Tosh showed up, my job was to dive under the mat somewhere and not be seen until he has, and not breathe, in case I breathe his oxygen before he passes. It's, isn't it true, Pasi? That's, that's how it was. And then now he's supposed to call me his spiritual father, his spiritual authority. How? Like, even I get confused about that. And so, you're not alone, uh, Joanne. It's, 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 you guys are raising real issues here. And I think we do need to say them because it's stuff we're all grappling with as a team. Uh, Pastor Shu, you've been standing for a long time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Kilons. I think <laughs> <laughs> what makes following hard. So, I'll answer based on why do I follow. Yeah. I actually wasn't following when I was growing up, just as every other child wants to just run away from home and just go and try. And for me, I think because I had not understood what salvation was and I was believing in the salvation of my parents, which was, I felt like it was deeds. I was being told, do, I do. Uh, or I struggled to do because I was not understanding what salvation was. Yeah. Until when I got uh, to understand uh, what surrender was, and what it means for me to be born again was actually to die and allow God to take full control of me. And at that time, uh, it didn't make sense why my parents would tell me, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other, and why the Bible had so many rules for me to follow. But the day I got to understand that salvation actually means following Christ and doing exactly what it says, I stopped thinking and I said, God, whatever you tell me today, I remember I would practice and say, God, when I wake up today, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Yeah. Every day. It became easy to the point of when I was in campus, I just said, God, me, I'm waiting for what you want me to do. So when I finish, if you tell me it's ministry, ministry. I was telling my friends, me, I don't know any other job because this is where God told me to come and I came. Wow. And being at that place of knowing what salvation is, it's an everyday journey of asking God, what do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to talk to? Where do you want me to go? So for me, why I, I think people find it hard is because they do not know why. And they do not understand, again, 
Salvation actually means dying to self and allowing God to do and say and tell you what to act or become. Yeah. Wow. Salvation is putting your brain in the kit bag. All right, one last one. Uh, one standing over there. Uh, good morning. My name is Jonathan from Mavuno South. Come on, Jonathan. Uh, what makes me uh, fear to follow is the fear of unknown. Fear of the unknown. I don't know what, if, if I follow, what will happen next. Yeah. If, am I going to lose my identity? And again, uh, having achieved a lot without the help of someone, yeah. which I thought that is what I was doing, only to realize that there's someone who I followed who, so that I, I have achieved what I have achieved today, is, uh, and again, not, not trusting God completely, wow. that he will take me through to the next phase. Wow, kind of, let's appreciate everybody who has shared. Thank you so much, really good feedback. You know guys, this stuff we're being told, if it was easy, everyone would have done it in the Bible. If it was easy, everybody would have done it. And um, you know, we've shared such powerful reasons why following is difficult. I'd put a few, I just put four, which I thought were covering, but I can see you've even shared some I didn't have. Can you just go to the next slide? And I'll try and just finish quickly. Countercultural. It's countercultural. Everything is screaming at us that we're supposed to be leaders. And we don't, we don't understand why we're supposed to follow. Uh, Mark 10, verse 35 to 37. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And eventually he says, okay, go next verse. Oh, okay. No next verse. Okay, all right. So ultimately they said, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. It's not what you guys were saying earlier. I think it was Pastor Tosh who said, I came in here to lead. So James and John had come to lead. They were like, we're here. I mean, it's like guys are angling for positions. Uh, this thing is about us becoming in charge of everybody else. Uh, Jesus says, not so among you. Not so among you. This is what the Gentiles do. He's saying, this thing about angling for leadership and angling for positions and angling for... That's what the Gentiles do. But he says, the greatest among you will become your servant. Jesus was... It's an upside-down kingdom. And Pastor Shu is absolutely right. When we, the reason we struggle is because we don't understand the upside-down kingdom of Jesus because we are so used to the upright world of the world. The way the world thinks is completely opposed to the way Jesus came. It was a countercultural thing. Um, for disciples, it's like push. Come on. I'm sh in fact, in that story, in another scripture, it says it's, it's the mother who comes. Like even your mom is the one who's like, you've been following Jesus for how long? Are you the leader yet? Can I see your report card? Why aren't you, the, why aren't you number one? In fact, even goes to lobby the teacher. How many parents here? You know, I've got there some helicopter. There's some serious moms. I can see a few hands going up, my wife included. Those, they're called mama bears. Teachers are afraid of mama bears. It's like, why, why does my son have a C minus? Every school this child has gone, he has never got a C minus until he came to your class. What's happening here? Huh? It's, like, it's like, seriously? It's like, my child is a leader, not a follower. And it's just the way of the world. It goes against the grain of everything we've been taught. Think for yourself. Be ambitious. Blaze your own trail. Number two, death to self. That's what it calls, that, that's what this is calling us to. Second Timothy 2 verse 4, it says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. That's death. And Major Boke told us how dangerous, I mean, how difficult that is because it's like you hand in your ID. It must feel like dying when you hand in your ID. It's like you're shaking because it's like, that's it. It's gone. You no longer can appeal to a court of law. Do you know what it means? If you're in the army, you can't go to the judge and say, I was mistreated. Because the law of Kenya does not apply to you. There is something called military law. You cannot go to a normal court and say, I was mistreated by my superior. Because there's something called a military court where the laws are completely different and they operate just for people like you. You've handed in your life. When you trade that ID in, you've traded in your life. You trade in your haircut. <laughs> All the signs of individuality, the things that marked you as different. I mean, I'm looking at you guys, you have such beautiful haircuts right now and hairstyles. In the army, there's no such thing. 
Uh, the army tells you how to dress, how to look, what hairstyle to have. Who does that? That's why when Jesus says, come and fuck, you have to die to yourself, people leave him. People desert him. You know, we always think of ourselves, when we read the scripture, we read ourselves into the people who followed Jesus. Me, I think I feel like I'm more like a Peter. Uh, me, I'm like the rock kind of guy. <laughs> but the Bible tells us most of the people around Jesus deserted until he asked those 12, even you, are you going to desert? And they said, where else shall we go? In other words, we've already cut off everything. We don't even have anywhere to go. Where else can we go? And they're like, you're the, one, you're the one who has the words for us. Like, it was not cool. Because people don't die to themselves naturally. But as Pastor Shu says, that's what, that's what he's calling us to. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Week four, Miss Easy. You remember all memorizing that. Now you know what it means. <laughs> it means you die to yourself. Discipline was the third one. Um, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. It says, We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. We don't want you to be lazy. <laughs> to inherit. You know, it's interesting because it's like Christ died for me. So that's, it's by grace. But look at that verse again because it's saying to imitate, we want you to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Like, like think about that scripture. What is he saying? He's saying that for you to, through faith and patience inherit, you need to imitate those who already have that. And he's saying not to do so is to be lazy. There are many lazy Christians today. They just want to sit, go to church, do what, <laughs> do what suits them, and then wait for heaven. But, 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 but the writer of Hebrews is saying we don't want you to be lazy. We want you to be... I mean, that's, it's not what Major Boke said. You can't be lazy and a soldier. Those two words don't fit together. And there's a discipline. And discipline is hard. I mean, when the man said that he and his wife exercise, they work out five days a week. How many of you gulped? Gulp. I'd seen some people, when he walked on, he's looking so trim and nice. Guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, five days a week, you're like, sure. <laughs> That's your grace. <laughs> uh, that is your anointing. That's the anointing of your house. Yeah, yeah. praise God for people who are blessed. They're anointed. <laughs> it's not for people like me. <laughs> It takes energy and effort to occupy. It does. To have dominion over the earth. It takes energy and effort. And that's not our natural state. It takes cutting down on Netflix. Yeah. Social media. It takes being different from everybody else around you because the average Kenyan is spending four, five hours on social media daily. You're not going to rule and dominate over your industry by spending four hours on social media, my friends. It doesn't work. There's discipline. But that's the way most of us have grown up. We pacify ourselves by sitting down on that couch, by doing unproductive stuff, because we don't know discipline. Discipline is beating your body. That's how Paul says it. There's a DG called Beat Your Body DG, Pastor Courier. <laughs> Yeah, it's so much easier to just say, hey, that's your calling. <laughs> hey, I'm not like you, that's your calling. Pastor Milton is so anointed, that's his calling. Hey, sh hey the way he prays and guys just start falling down. Hey, sh wow, that's my pastor. <laughs> yeah, but who wants to pay the cost? And that's what Jesus asked those boys when they said, we want to be next to you. They're like, Can you, will you drink this cup? And his cup really means, are you willing to die? And the boys, of course, because they don't even know what he's saying, they're like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> when the soldiers show up at the tomb, they're the at, the, at the Garden of Gethsemane, they're the first guys out of there. That's, how the, that's the cup they're willing to drink. <laughs> that's what they're saying. I mean, it's like, yeah, you think you can do it, but when the discipline is called for, you're out of there. It takes resources. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone comes, wants to come after me, he must... Oh, come on, let's say that together. He must... Deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. What? I thought Christianity was just accepting Jesus and waiting to go to heaven. And coming for prayer meeting and getting bigger every day. Getting double portion anointing. I thought that was what it was about. 
And then Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot come after me unless you're willing to deny yourself. Ah, that brain of yours that is so intellectual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, I liked what Major Boke said because he said, you put it in the kit bag, but after six months, you start, you're allowed to start removing it a bit. Progressively. <laughs> so it's not that they don't want your brain. They just don't want your brain your way. Yeah. God gave you that brain. He gave you that intellect, but not ruled by you. Yeah. He'll still use it, by the way. He will. When he chooses to use it. Hey, let me give you a story, true story. One of my professors at Fuller Seminary, uh, he was an intellectual giant of his time, even among his peers. He had a, a PhD from, um, I think it was Princeton. No, it was Harvard. Harvard. And then he had a PhD at Fuller. I mean, he was just this guy, even his peers. He was an intellectual giant, like looked up to even in the theological world. God gave him an instruction. Come on, Pastor Shu. God gave him an instruction. God told him, I want you to quit being a professor. And God told him, I have another assignment for you. I want you to go and be a director in a mental institution for children. Children who have serious, serious learning disability until their parents have to put them in an institution to take care of them. And so he applied for the job. Obviously, he was way, way overqualified, but they were great to have him. He left the prestige of that office and the pay and the perks and the publishing papers all over the world. And he went into this place. He writes a book called In His Name. You can actually get that on Kindle, In His Name. He writes this book and he talks about that journey. And he talks about the fact that he was all of a sudden catapulted into a world where Nobody cared wow. what degrees you had. Wow. They didn't care how much you knew. All they cared about is how much you loved them. Wow. And this incredible professor, he was on his knees with his kids, loving them <coughs> until he died. What? Yeah. Sounds tragic, doesn't it? It's like, what a waste. What a waste of a great intellect. But who made that intellect? Yeah. Who's the porter? Who's the one who knew why he made that intellect? How dare the clay say to the porter, why would you waste me? God made that intellect for those children. And so this man could actually take the lessons he learned and write a book that became a, a, a hit and has taught Christians across the world about what it means to die to Christ, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So, yes, you have a great, great intellect. Praise God. <laughs> but you didn't give it to yourself. Yeah, there's somebody who gave it to you. But you know, this is one of the reasons why we struggle. You know, it's interesting because I want to just end by saying, knowing the cost, why must we follow? Why must we still follow. And I've got some, 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 some reasons I want to leave you with. Why we must still follow, knowing how expensive it is, knowing how hard it is, knowing how, how, how inconvenient it is, knowing how countercultural it is, knowing how it's death to self, all those things that make us not follow. Why must we still follow? There are some reasons why you must, as a follower of Jesus, it's not an option for you. You must follow. You must follow. Knowing how this is how Carl started. What did Martin say? Yeah, knowing this is... I, I know there are some of you who have thought that thought. Thank you for saying it. Because there are people who haven't said it, but they've thought it. It's like every cult we've had of had a moment like this. One moment they were a good ministry. The next they were doing irrational things. <laughs> they were eating grass. Yeah, every cult. You know, by the way, what I tell people, I always say the answer to bad fathers is not no fathers. It's good fathers. And many times what happens is people who are evil apply the scripture and people who are righteous look at that application and say we will never apply it yeah we can't we saw people misuse speaking in tongues we will never speak in tongues we saw people misuse titles like apostle and 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 and, and spiritual gifts we will never use spiritual gifts the answer to abuse is not inactivity 
It is redeeming that by showing what God intended for it. So I, I, I'm, I, I, I have struggled with that, but I've decided I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to settle for less because I'm afraid of what people say about me. Yeah, I'm not going to settle for less because fear of following, of, of being called a cult could stop us from getting into what God wants us to do. Let me tell you guys, we have a pedigree of being called a cult. Don't fear being called a cult. Mavuno was called a cult long before you joined. Yeah. When we decided we we're going to reach non-Christians and we we're going to start a church for people who don't like our church, we were called a cult then. If we are still going now, it hasn't stopped us and we're still doing God's work. Why should we be afraid that people will call us a cult? As long as we're obeying what the Lord is telling us, we need to, he's the one who we, call, who, who we want to please. He's the one we want to please, not what other people think. So here, here are some reasons why we must, why we must do it. Number one, discipleship equals following. Discipleship equals following. It's just as simple as that. Matthew 16, 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You can't be a disciple if you're not, a com if you're not commandable, if you're not taking up your cross, if you're not following. Jesus did not mean for you to become saved and go to church and be an usher and wait for heaven. That's not the plan. That's not his plan for you. His plan for you is that you will take up your cross, that you will follow, that you will die to yourself. That's what he died for. He died for you that you may die to yourself and be filled with the Spirit of God and do God's will on earth. That's what he wants you to do. Your commission is to make disciples. Not just to be a disciple, he wants you to also make other people to be your disciples. This is what he made you for. I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, that's the song you're singing in Sunday school. It was actually telling you about today. <laughs> yeah, that it's not just a little nice song. That he wants you to make fishers of men. That God's intention is to take back dominion. Take back what the devil stole. That what the devil did by cutting in and taking authority over the earth from Adam and Eve, that our job is to restore it. How do we restore it? Why was it taken away from Adam and Eve? Because the devil told them, use your brain for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it? Because the devil came and said, come on, think for yourself. All these trees, why would God tell you not to touch that one? Can't you think for yourself? In fact, you will even be wiser. God is afraid of you. Yeah. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus comes and reverses. He's the second Adam. He comes to do what Adam should have done. And what does he do? He says, Lord, this is what I want. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Yeah. And he dies. The irrational thing. He puts his brain, his desires, he puts them in the kit bag. And he puts his hands on the cross and he's nailed there. Because that's what his father desires for him. This is why he came to earth. Not for what he desires, but for, for what the Father desires. Wow, so good. And he says to us now, we live the way he lived. We do what he's called. This is what discipleship is. Number one, discipleship equals following. Number two, it helps people to learn to obey God without hesitation. If you're struggling to obey an earthly father, you will also struggle to obey your, your heavenly father. First Samuel 15 verse 24, very interesting verse. It says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better to, than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Oh my goodness, yes, God wants you to come and bring a sacrifice of praise and sing songs and be, like, be in love with him. He wants all that stuff. But if he had a choice, he would say, don't do that if you're not obeying. I'd rather you obey me and don't come to worship. <laughs> Yeah, I'd rather you're obeying. I'd rather you are learning to obey. That's more important to me than worship night. That you're an obedient servant. God is saying to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, it's very interesting because we, we, we uh, earthly parents know this. Earthly parents know this. We train our children all the time. I've, taught you, I've told you guys that Cara, Pastor Kara and I, we trained our children on quick obedience. Quick obedience is, no, slow obedience is disobedience in our house. And if you ask my kids, they'll tell you that. Some, if you tell them quick obedience, you'll even see them standing up straight. <laughs> they, know, they know what that meant. And for us, what we, we, we taught them that when daddy calls, you don't do your thing and then come. You stop and you come. But why was that? Because I didn't want one day, as a child is walking onto the road and I'm far, 
And I see them walking and I say, stop! And they're like, okay, daddy, I'm about to stop. <laughs> they're dead. As a parent, you know, it's so important that your child stops when you call them. Because it could save their lives. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, many times as Christians, God tells us, I want you to do this. And it's like, okay, God, I'm coming. Yeah. Let me first earn some money. I'm coming. Devil is on you. I don't want to teach my disciples to be people who think when God speaks. Yeah. yeah. It's not good for them. It's not good for them. It's training. You train. We're, discipleship is training. And that's what we're doing. We're teaching you to obey. And teaching to obey means that you, when you hear God's voice, it's like done. I love what Rashika said. I got to a place where I would say, God, what do you want me to do today? I'm learning that, by the way. I'm, I'm not even there yet. I still, there's some people I'm watching and I'm like, oh my God, one day when I grow up. Pastor Kara and I were being challenged. There's a pastor that we, we, are, we are being told about. And I mean, did you feel rebuked that day? The one who just listens to God for all strategy, spends days in prayer, and has raised billions of shillings, literally. It's building a city, never fundraised, never ask for money, just goes to the mountain, spends five days and says to God, okay, if you want that, bring the people with the money. Uh, one of the stories is somebody came to his church, a gentleman who was paralyzed and um, was of Asian origin, a wealthy businessman, but paralyzed. And just so people, because there's just prayer, prayer. So people coming to the church and the person asked, who was being taken to hospital for a checkup. And he saw the crowd and he told his driver, what are those people doing? He says, they're praying. So he says, maybe I can also go there and pray. So he didn't even want to enter the room. He just went and sat in the grounds on his wheelchair, paralyzed. And as he sat on the ground, he just felt warmth. And he stood up to check what was happening on his seat. <laughs> and the girl was so excited. He started shouting and screaming. And people came running. What's wrong? What's wrong? He's just shouting. And the driver came and told him, sit down. You're not supposed to be standing. <laughs> And long story short, the guy just said uh, there was a, a very long, uh, very dry road, messed up road uh, coming to the place. It would have cost millions upon millions of shillings. And the guy said, I'm paying for that road. Wow. Single-handedly, one person, not a Christian, just paid. God had told him, build here. He had said, Lord, there's no road there. The Lord told him, build. The road will come. Wow. I said, Lord, I want to be like that. <laughs> I have not reached that level. <laughs> I want to be at a place where I don't even tell you guys. I just pray. And the Lord brings Geneva with five million shillings and says, here, have. The Lord has spoken to me about your need before you mentioned it. Yeah, that's what the Lord wants us to be in. But how do we get there? It's that place of obedience. It's that place of understanding the Father's voice. We are listening for his command. That's more important than anything. Number three, God rewards obedience. God rewards obedience. Jesus replied, but even more blessed. Somebody had said, the mother who bore you must be so blessed. Jesus replied, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Come on, somebody. I mean, this is something. I mean, if you're Catholic, you've, you've seen the Catholics who, who say the blessed virgin. Like, what an amazing thing. And when you think about it from human terms, the person who bore Jesus in her womb must be the most blessed human being on earth. It makes sense. Except Jesus says, not so. He says, the person who obeys me is more blessed than her. Wow. It's here. I didn't say it. He says, but even more blessed. God honors obedience. Genesis 22 verse 18. I hadn't given you this verse. It says to, uh, he says to Abraham, and through you, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. Wow. Do you understand that today, when Christians make wealth, it's because of that promise. Because Deuteronomy 18, it tells us that God gives us the ability to make wealth and so fulfills his covenant. Who did he make the covenant with? Father Abraham. Why did he make the covenant with Abraham? Because Abraham would not even withhold his son. He put his brain in the kit bag. When God says, that son I've given you, I want you to sacrifice him. Who does that? Which intellectual person does a foolish thing like that? And God says, because you obey me, 
all your descendants. And we're still being blessed, by the way, because of our father Abraham. Yeah. James 1.22, it says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. And then it says, if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free and do what it says, verse 25, don't forget what you've heard. God will bless you for doing it. Just, just mark that down, James 1, 22, 25. Number four, it teaches people to hear God's voice. When people obey, they learn to hear God's voice for themselves. Do you understand that it's only when you obey that you start hearing? Have you ever heard people saying, Maze, God just told me, and you're like, I? Kwani, you, God just talks to you like that. Like, how does he talk to you? Have you ever felt like asking someone, like, how does he talk to you? Like, how come he talks to you and he doesn't talk to me? But you know what? It's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, the scripture put there, First Samuel chapter 3, verse 4 to 10. It says, Then the Lord calls Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And then just go to verse 5, the interesting verse. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Have you noticed a very interesting thing there? That when God spoke, the voice he used sounded like Samuel's spiritual father. And Samuel was confused because the voice God was using was Eli's voice. Now, the weird thing in this case, somebody said this leader who misleads, the one who's messed up, Eli was a messed up spiritual father. He was not a good man. He let his sons run amok and do horrible things in God's temple. He didn't care. But when God came to speak to Samuel, he spoke in Eli's voice. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. God honors spiritual fatherhood. He does. I can't, somebody told me yesterday, I'm trying to remember who it was, I can't even remember. By the way, I forget things very quickly, eh? so never take it personally. But somebody came and told me, Pastor M, whenever you've given me a word, it's the same word God has given me. In fact, many times God has already spoken to me that word before. The voice of my earthly father and the voice of my heavenly father are, are aligned. You know, it's very interesting. God speaks to Samuel. Samuel hears Eli. And Eli says, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> it must be somebody else. And eventually Eli gets it and he says, when you hear my voice next time, just say, here I am, Lord. When you hear my voice next time, say, here I am, Lord, speak to me. And Samuel says that. And God gives him a prophecy, first of all, about his spiritual father. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. But the crazy thing for me is, when I teach my child to hear my voice, and I'm talking about even the children I brought up in my house, when I, why do I teach them to hear my voice? Because one day, when God speaks to them, he will sound like me. Wow. Yeah, he will. Wow. And if I brought them up in God's ways, he will use the same voice I used. So it's important that they learn to hear a father's voice. And maybe some of us really struggle hard with all this stuff about following because we were never taught growing up to hear a father's voice. There was no father to speak. And some people struggle a lot more because of that. They have learned about God through absence. And that's not, it's not necessarily a good thing, but my prayer is it's created a hunger in you for the real thing. That now you long for it and you're like, I do want to learn to hear a father's voice. But this is a beautiful thing. I, I know friends, by the way. Uh, I keep tell, I've told you guys this story about my friend who was a fifth generation pastor that I met in the US. And how easily he just flowed with God. He just seemed to always be in tune with what God was saying. He had so much favor wherever he went. And I just believe what had happened is God had spoken to his father through his father's voice. I mean, five generations of just hearing a father, a godly father. And now it's like, I just flow. I follow easily. Wow. But do you know people around you who follow? There are some people here who've told me that. For me, I have no problem. I follow easily. It doesn't just happen. Something happened to help you follow easily. Yeah, teaching my children to follow helps them to learn to understand God's voice. Number five, it teaches people to love God. Why do I have to teach my people to obey? <laughs> it's an awkward thing, by the way, to, to ask you, I want you to obey me. Pastor Zuse, I want you to obey. When you go to Blanta with your beautiful wife, come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah. 
I want you to understand that there's a father's voice and I want you to obey that voice. That's a very radical thing to say, by the way. I'll be honest, that's not a natural thing for me to say. But I've come to understand, and why I would say it now, is because when people obey, they learn to love God. This is an interesting thing. Um, first, John 5, 2 to 3, says, By this we know we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. For God, command, following commands and loving are one and the same. I can't say I love you, Lord, but let me think about what you've just told me. Those two things are contradictory. I teach you love when I teach you obedience. Uh, John 14, 21 says, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. True love is shown through obedience. Number six, we save their lives. Am I preaching good, by the way? Because you guys are sounding like you're tired. The guys on this side are sounding tired. Yeah, can, can I... Can I All right, all right, I can hear them. Yeah, guys at the back, am I preaching good? Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We've got just, okay, I can shorten, by the way, because I have, okay, all right, let me, let me move, let me move quick and finish them, because I know you need tea. <laughs> all right, you need tea or you need tea, okay, all right, I love it. Now, amen, amen. We save their lives, we save their lives when we teach to, to obey. Here's the thing we need to understand, that when people don't have leadership, they, don't ha they die. The Bible says without vision, a people perish. People perish. Major Bokeh talked about that yesterday. He said that when, 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 there are too many general, when there are too many armies in the army, people die. You actually die. That's why in the army they teach you to hear one voice, so that you have one army. And then you have a vision, and with that vision people live. Without a vision, people die. Another, command, another version says, a people are unrestrained. When there's no vision, there are no boundaries. Everybody does what they see fit. And that's the story of the book of Judges, by the way. In the book of Judges, it says, a time came when nobody knew the Lord, and everybody did as they saw fit. And when they began to do that, idolatry was the order of the day. Read the book of Judges. It's a sad book. It's a book of people who are unrestrained, who will not follow, who do what everybody sees fit. People die. When you don't learn to obey, when you don't learn to follow in your compass, people will die in that compass. They will die because they're unrestrained and because there are 10, 15, 30 visions in that church and that church will go nowhere. I mean, uh, the tradition I came from, which was Nairobi Chapel's tradition, my other tradition after when I became an adult Christian, it's called Brethren, and that's a tradition Pastor Daniel and Nancy came from. A lot of German churches uh, come from that tradition. And that, that, ver that verse is so true. Without vision, churches, you see these little churches going around in the wilderness for 50 years. They've never reached 100 people. And they're just going around 100 years. Just going round and round, just being a place where people come and go back. It's a Sunday church. And yes, people are faithful, they love God, but they are dying. It's not going anywhere because they won't agree to be led. And that's a thing in that culture. People just don't want to be led. And so they say, in fact, it was so radical. In Nairobi Chapel, you guys don't know this story, the church we came from. Before Pastor Oscar came, he was the first pastor they ever had. Before that, there were a typical brethren church. What a brethren church does is, and it's beautiful in theory, because they come and they sit down and they don't even have a worship team. It's like whoever the Holy Spirit moves will stand up and call out a song. And everybody will stand up. It's spirit-led. We're not led by people. And they'll sing that song. And when they're done, they'll sit down and be quiet. And somebody will stand up and say, I want to read a scripture. And they'll read it. And then they'll sit down. And then somebody else will say, I would like to share the word for the day. I feel like the Holy Spirit has impressed. And they'll preach the sermon. Maze, it sounds so amazing, isn't it? A church where only the Holy Spirit is leading, no human beings. And the thing about the Brethren churches, they're all small. They're all tiny. This church struggled. And one day they went to Nairobi Baptist and said, we need help. We need help. It was a church that was all mostly former British, uh, actually British citizens who had become Kenyan citizens, some of them. And they went and asked for help. They said, send us a pastor. And you know what? They had spent six months 
in prayer and fasting because the church was dying. And God said to them, get a leader. Get a leader. <laughs> I want to lead you, but I can't lead you if you don't have a leader. Doesn't that sound radical? Because you'd be like, you're already leading us. In fact, we don't have a leader, so you can lead us. And God said to them, get a leader. So they went to Nairobi Baptist. Nairobi Baptist said to them, there's an intern. We don't know what to do with him. Uh, Oscar Muriu, you can take him and his wife. Young couple, just married. And they went. And the rest was history. Within just a few years, that church was a leading influential church, growing in leaps and bounds, reaching people in this city. And the difference was a leader. When we teach people to follow, what are we teaching them? We're teaching them to, to live. We're teaching them to live. When your child isn't taught to follow, they go, Pastor Geneva, you can, you're a HR practitioner. You have a lot of these children coming to work for your bank. And, you, and your job now is to be a mother because they don't know how to follow. And especially the younger generation now. I know I'm talking for HR practitioners in this house. And they come and they're supposed to turn into the office at this time and they're wondering, but why can't I work from home? Why am I supposed to? It's like, why am I supposed to be told anything? It's a headache. And they think they can talk to their boss the way they want. And they can even send that. Uh, by the way, they resign through WhatsApp. I'm done. <laughs> am I lying, by the way? It's ex with emojis, by the way. <laughs> you need to save your children's lives. Yeah. You cannot live like that. You can't live like that. That's not the way the world is structured. Save their lives. Teach them to obey. Number seven, we help them experience blessing and joy. When people obey, by the way, they experience blessing and joy. Um, it's interesting because Psalm 119 verse 1 says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Obedience. When you're obedient to the law of God, guess what happens? You're blameless. And it says you're blessed. Blessed, the other word in the scripture would be happy are those. Happy are those. Blessed are those. Uh, following leads to blessing. Psalm 133 is that famous scripture. It talks about the people who are united, brothers and sisters dwelling together in unity. And then what happens? Right? Anointing right from the head of their spiritual head. Aaron is a spiritual leader of Israel. It doesn't even say from the king's head. It says from the priest's head. And it says the whole of Israel is blessed when these people live in unity. And the blessing comes from the head of their priest. That there's something that's beautiful that begins to happen. Blessing. It says there the Lord commands a blessing. Like God actually commands blessings into your midst because of unity, because of following. Number eight, we help them win. We help them win. The easiest way to guarantee failure in battle is to send civilians. Yeah. You've seen this. Uh, and I say we've seen this. You send out people to change the world and they get eaten up alive. Many, many organizations were started with Christian, by Christians with good and beautiful intentions. And then what happened? They, didn't, they were not part of an army. And the world just came and swallowed them alive. And so you can't start by yourself. You need an army behind you, backing you up if you want to win. Genesis 11, 6 says, if as one people speaking the same language, they begin to do one thing, nothing will be impossible. Number nine, it helps us avoid being a cozy, comfortable, complacent family. You know, right now we've gotten into a place where we're a family. And family is fun, isn't it? It was hard to get Mavuno to be a family because we were suspicious. We were, we were this church that had never experienced it. But right now, let me just tell you, I go into the campuses and I can tell people enjoy being part of family. And it's so easy to say, but we're enjoying this. This is working. It's working. It's working. Yeah, it's working. It's so, um, it's exciting. It's beautiful. But you know what happens? If your family remains the way it is right now, it will become a cozy, complacent family. Your church will become a complacent church. It will become a place that is not attractive to anybody because people will come and they'll find you being a click, a click or a club. Have you ever gone to a church where people are just a club? Like you feel like a stranger. They're not even looking at you because they're not interested in you. They just enjoy the fellowship with each other. And so this is one of the ways. By teaching obedience, you're teaching people to move away from being cozy and complacent. Ma Matthew verse, uh, 25 verse 26, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, you knew I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Um, you know, it's interesting because this guy doesn't follow his master. 
He doesn't follow. And he's called a lazy servant. His master calls him a lazy servant. Wow. Wow. Man, I've got such good points. Like three more. Can I just share them? Like, 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 like these ones are really good. Like, 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 I feel like I don't want to stop without. I know you need to go for a bathroom break, but these ones you don't want to miss. Can, can I just share them and then we stop? All right, all right. Number 10, it trains people to listen to one voice and avoid danger. To avoid danger. You know, it's very interesting. Because we are revelation junkies, there's a lot of doctrine that is flowing around. There are a lot of things that are taught everywhere when you listen to so many voices. And what, what, what um, the Bible says, it says God sets aside a hierarchy in the church. He puts in leadership. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors. And it says to, to prepare God's people for works of ministry. So the body is built up and becomes mature. And then he says, not being blown away by every wind of doctrine. That when the church is not structured the way it is, where there are, there's an apostolic leadership, there's prophets who are recognized under that apostolic leadership, there are pastors, all the stuff that a movement has, then what happens is every wind of doctrine will blow God's people away. Pastors will come into town, prophets will come into town and teach all manner of things. I think we have quite a few prophets in our country, but not as bad as Uganda. Like, like in Uganda, like it's a thing. Like I'm always shocked at how many prophetic ministries. They're not churches, just prophetic ministries. It's like go to your church if you want to be buried, but here is where we do prophetic ministry. This is a place of revelation. And my goodness, I mean, you guys can, you guys can testify. There's a lot of doctrine there that is just dodgy. It's dodgy. But part of the reason is because people are not aligned. It's almost like you're moving from place to place. There's no spiritual cover. And that's what happens when you don't train your people, that they fall into winds of doctrine. I believe a time is coming and has already come when this will become a clear and present danger to the Kenyan church. Yeah. I think we are, we are heading there. These are the last days. There will be many, many false doctrines that are taught across our land. And the only protection and cover for God's people will be being anchored, being anchored and being planted in a house where there's cover for them. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. You will see it in your lifetime, by the way. A time is coming when people will believe things that will make your eyes roll. I was talking to Bishop Steve, one of my friends in New Zealand. He's a bishop of the Anglican Church there. And oh my goodness, the things that people are teaching in churches in the name of Jesus are despicable. It is stuff that is completely opposed to Scripture. By the way, he's the only bishop in the whole country, <laughs> the whole nation, there's only one bishop who is a conservative Bible-believing Christian. All the other bishops in the Anglican Church believe in gay marriage, believe abortion is okay, believe in things that are completely opposed to Scripture. It's so bad that basically what the, what the church decided is we will actually allow any church, any parish in the country that wants to believe in the Bible uh, and is under a certain bishop. To avoid splitting the church, they said, Bishop Steve can be your bishop, even though you're here. So as the Kenyan, he's the one in charge of the church that is believing the Bible. The church that believes in the Bible. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? Like things are so thick that it's a Kenyan bishop who believes the Bible and he's the only one in the country. And any other priest anywhere else with a church that believes the Bible can only affiliate to him because there's nobody else to be their spiritual head. Yeah, it's coming. And it will come in our lifetime, by the way. It looks impossible right now. But you are going to be the ones who are alive to see this thing happening. And how will we avoid being blown by every wind of doctrine? It's those churches that understand how to teach obedience, how to teach following. Number 11, it increases. By the way, are you convinced about following at this point? Because I can, I can give you another five, but let me just... Are you convinced? Because if you're not convinced, I can keep going. <laughs> all right, all right. Two more. Increases speed. We increase their speed when we teach them to follow. Originality is slow, but imitation brings acceleration. 
It does. Jesus said, Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. These men had ambitions. They wanted to be fishers. They just didn't know what, how big the thing they were called to catch. They thought they were called to catch tilapia, but they were actually called to catch people. Human beings made in God's image. And you know what? I have no shame asking people to follow me because I know that when they follow, they become what God wants them to be. Yeah, God wants you to become something great. Pastor James wanted to be a president. Come on, somebody. I would never be a president. Not because there's anything wrong with being a president. But if I stop being Pastor M to become a president, I consider that would be a demotion for me right now. Because presidents cannot change hearts. They can set rules and then they, are, they move. They don't have eternal impact. I have a role that is above every role. And so do you. And in that job that you have, the bigger job you have is that you're an ambassador to the kingdom, the unseen kingdom, the powerful kingdom. This is a job that will last after the other job goes. The other job is actually an entry point for the kingdom of God into your industry and career. Yeah. And so you need to understand that. If people don't follow, they will miss that out. They will live mediocre lives. They will live small lives and think that they're doing well. They will go slowly. They will think they're going fast, but they'll be going slowly because they're not in what they're supposed to be doing. But when they follow, come on, somebody. Yeah, people. And you will see God doing amazing things in their lives when they understand following. The last one. The last one. It segments people. It segments people. John 2.24 says, But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. You know, a good marketer, wants to catch as many people as possible and to sell the product to as many. It, it seems logical. Jesus deliberately made it hard for some people to follow. It's like he put barriers in the way. And the reason is because he was trying to sift between consumers, attenders, and people who really wanted to get it. And so he would teach in parables and people would be excited but they wouldn't get it. And then he would withdraw for those who are following to come and ask the questions. Then he would tell them what he was actually saying. And it's like he was actually, even the disciples were confused. Why are you teaching in parables? You know, when I teach obedience, here's the thing, it sounds very harsh. I love people in Mavuno, by the way. When I come to Mavuno Church, I love everybody in that congregation. But I also understand not everybody is ready for the revelation that God has given us. Wow. Not everybody. Some people are here for different motives. People are here because their children like Mavuno kids. People are here because it's convenient. It's a church next door. People are here because they're beautiful girls. And it's a nice place to be. It's true. They're beautiful girls in this church, by the way. And some very handsome dudes as well. Some fine guys. I mean, they have all kinds of motives. And the scripture talks about giving pearls to swine. It's a very harsh metaphor. But what it's really talking about is giving something very precious to somebody that cannot understand it. Somebody who will trample on it as opposed to using it and appreciating it. And Jesus did not want to waste his effort on those. For the crowds, he fed them bread because they came for bread so they could go home. But for those he remained, he gave the bread of life. Yeah. And so there are people who come to Mavuno for bread. I give them bread. But I want to segment. By the way, can I tell you a secret? That's why we do the gathering. Because it's hard to do a gathering. It's hard to come out for four days. I know. On a weekday, I know. Many people will not make that sacrifice. They won't prioritize it. They'll say there's something going on. You know, this is a, this is a month I get deals. This is a month my business grows. And so they won't come. And they'll say they'll watch the video. But you know YouTube has a count on videos watched. So I can tell they don't actually watch the video. But that's okay. Because they were not ready for this. You go into the army with people who are there for bread and you lose the war. I would rather be a Gideon with an army of 300 who are anointed by the Spirit of God than have 10,000 people who are just there and they don't know why they're there. Yeah. We don't, need, we, don't need to be, we don't need to be 10,000 to succeed and to take this world. We just need an army of people who know why they are there. And I want to just end by commending you 
and saying, you're those people who've taken that time, who've taken the inconvenience, who've died to yourselves, who've allowed your businesses to suffer so that you can be in God's house receiving His Word and understanding the deeper things of the Spirit. And God will bless you for it. Jesus says to His disciples, those who have left those things to follow, the blessings will come not just in heaven, but here on earth, there will be blessings for you as well. And I believe it's true for you that God will not let you suffer because you followed. Because God is not a debtor to any man. He says, houses, husbands, wives, all those things they left. He says, you will receive them on this earth and even more in the world to come. And this is why it's important that we teach people following. Because not everybody around you really wants to get it. Some people are just there for what they came for. And this allows you to segment people. And you are the ones. Many are called, few are chosen. You are the chosen ones. You're the chosen ones. You're here. You're here to grapple with the truths and to make them yours. And so the last, uh, the last picture there, just put the picture about God and trusting your leaders. Just put the picture that shows in the slides. God has entrusted your leader with blessings on your behalf. And God has entrusted you with blessings on behalf of those who follow you. But even if two bottles are the same size, one has to go down in order to receive something for the other. Yeah? Yeah. By the way, none of this says your leader is more qualified. Some, you guys are more, many of you are more qualified than I am. Many of you are better speakers than I am. Many of you would make better pastors or better prophets than I am. And I have no illusions about that. But somehow God has chosen me to pour blessing to you. It's just the way He's done it. It's not me who chose it. I wasn't there when He chose. God has chosen you to pour blessings into the people in your discipleship group, into the people in your compass. You didn't choose yourself. Jesus says, I chose you and I appointed you that you may bear fruit, fruit that will last. Come on, stand up somebody right now. If you're understanding, just say, I'm understanding. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I sense that there's revelation in this house. I sense that there's the entrance of your truth that is bringing light. I sense that, Lord, there's an army that is rising up that there are people who are getting spiritual revelation and understanding. Lord, I sense that you're opening our minds to understand why obedience is not an option. It's so important. Not only that we practice it, but that we teach it. Because this is how we save the lives of those around us. I thank you that there are some young people in this house, some very young, who are learning to be disciples in their young age. And that there are going to be teenagers in this city who will be discipled and led as these young ones start early. To make disciples of the nations. I thank you that Lord you're doing something new in our generation and I pray that Lord as you raise up this army now, this year is going to be that year when you put us in boot camp, you train us to follow, make us a radical call for the kingdom of God and that Lord Jesus the continents of this world will be changed. I see, I see, I see God raising people here and sending them to different nations of the earth. Yeah. I see it, and not in a long distance. Some of you have been praying. God has been waiting for you to be in this session before He releases you to go into the place you're supposed to go. And some of you are about to leave and go into those places of appointment. But you will go with a very different understanding. You're not going as a civilian. You're going as a representative. You're going as a soldier to represent Jesus in those places. Ah, God is giving you revelation to understand that yes, you have a career and something big that you want to do, but God always supersedes that. And even that career is a servant to the ministry that God is putting in your heart. It will help you to do that ministry more effectively. And God is doing that right now. I just sense that there's a shift that is happening. And so Father, I just commend your people to you. And I bless them now as a father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Amen. Let's give glory to Jesus. Amen.